I'm here to talk today uh, a little bit about um, what I've learnt about rapid prototyping as a way of connecting with creativity and intuition. It was after a dinner that I had with Deepak and Rudy Tanza in New York, and Deepak said, you should give a talk on it. So I thought, okay. Um, it's just a deep area inquiry of, of mine, looking at the intersection between creativity and design, the business world, the thrill of building something, and uh, behaving mindfully uh, in a way learning from others uh, around spirituality. So it's exciting to be at a, um, at a room like this where the inquiry is coming from so many angles. And as we know, we've all got uh, Deepak to thank for being the master assimilator. So my first uh, point is that a company, I'm just reacting a little bit to, to what we heard yesterday from Nancy, that a company does not have a consciousness. So the good thing is I'm not a scientist, so I can say what I want. I'm not on the record. Um, and it's my view that a company really is a, a, a collective of, of conscious people who make a choice and they arrange themselves uh, around, they arrange their behavior around values and beliefs and intentions, which we in business just call objectives within a business. So the choices the business makes in the design of its business, linked to purpose and vision, and values and beliefs and intention, really that is a way of harnessing the, the consciousness and attracting uh, the types of people depending on how those are encoded into the business. So consciousness is a conscious choice for business. Um, this is one of my early mentors, the only uh, man in my life, Max, until I got a dog, Molly. Um, and uh, this was me before I started my business, uh, very naive. It, oops, it didn't take me long to um, uh, be part of a process where you're constantly learning. And I started Icebreaker when I was 24 and 1994. And one of my burning questions at that time was, how do I not screw this up? You know, how can I? And I'll fill in the blank. So the, the objective which I had to start my business wasn't very profound. I found some, I was given some under, a farmer gave me some underwear. It's as simple as that. He threw um, some thermal underwear across the table, uh, but it was different. When I put it on, I fell in love with it because it was made from super fine merino wool. And merino wool is not like regular wool, it feels like silk against your skin. And for some reason, something went off inside of me where I could feel uh, at, at an uh, intuitive level, I, was, I didn't make a choice to start the business. The business kind of started within me when I put on those t-shirts. Um, the merino sheep in New Zealand is very different. It's a, uh, it's, an, it's a royal, heroic, high country animal that lives in an environment like this. And the opportunity that I saw literally in an instant after wearing it and physically connecting with it was the opportunity to build a global brand from New Zealand offering this amazing natural, renewable, biodegradable uh, fiber through outdoor clothing as an alternative to uh, petroleum-based products, which was the great irony of the sports and outdoor industry. So here I am in New Zealand, 24 years old, I used to enjoy mountain biking and running, but every day I wore polypropylene, which was made from, uh, made from uh, petroleum, and the only other option I had was polyester, and they stunk. And here I discovered this lightweight natural fiber through this chance meeting with the merino grower, uh, was it a chance? Uh, meeting with a merino grower that gave me this lightweight, technical, breathable product that didn't hold odor. So kind of my mission was, how can I turn this into something that other people can engage with? And if you had a look at it, it's just blue and white garments. They didn't look good. So I had to wrap some stuff around it. The first thing I did was try and get my thoughts together and write a business plan. I locked myself in my bedroom for three months. My... Um, Roommates thought it was because I had a new girlfriend at the time. But actually what I was doing was I was trying to um, pull all my thinking together. And it was only later, really, that I was encoding the intentions of my future. And I was making conscious choices. I was imagining what could happen globally. And I set myself the intention of building a global brand from New Zealand. 
We sell in 42 countries now. It hasn't been an easy path. We buy almost half the merino wool in New Zealand. Uh, we work with over 2 million acres of the high country of New Zealand. And for me, it's all a function of what was in that little document. The first idea we had to do was we had to create our own identity to differentiate us. Uh, being a fan of girl power, we kind of um, created some different, we, we bought mythology and we looked at the, the intersection of, of uh, humankind and animals and reflected on the fact that we're all animals and just created this kind of fun storytelling uh, vehicle around it and ended up building a clothing system which is about connecting people to nature using nature as opposed to covering yourself in petroleum. So you can see that we are into uh, the snow sports industry and biking and running and we do outerwear and lightweight t-shirts and women's underwear, which is the real reason I got into the business. And uh, that's my daughter, one of my daughters, Mia, in the far corner. And um, we sell all around the world. But it's what it's teaching me, which is one I want to talk to you about. The first thing was when I started seeing, when I started getting inside the company, when I started staying with the families that grew the marina wool in the mountains, there's a family which is uh, multi generational, which is governing 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 110,000 acres, typically with 10 or 20,000 animals. And it's a long-term system. The animals live, typically their, se their life cycle is seven to nine years. They come down from the mountains once a year to be shorn. And we started creating this little system, this way of looking at it. We called it ecosystem because on one side we have the economy, the money flowing through it because a business has to make a profit. Money is like blood in a body. You know, if I cut an artery, and if the blood flows out, it won't be here long. It's the same with a business. So a business has to be profitable. But the other side of the economic argument is the ecological argument. So the challenge then becomes within a business, how do we use, uh, how do we use resources in the most conscious way to achieve the necessary aims of a business, which is uh, economic? So we came up with this tension we called profitable sustainability, which was great. Except in 1997, I almost went broke because our garments started falling apart. Um, and I didn't know what to do. I was getting letters from customers uh, saying, you know, I could see the future of the whole wool industry in your garments and now I'm never buying another one. And what happened was we got a bad batch of wool and I was only buying yarn and making fabric. And I realized if we couldn't control the input, then we couldn't control the output. And what it actually triggered was the lesson which I'm constantly learning in business, the cycle of breakthrough and breakdown and breakthrough. Uh, whenever times get tough now, I, I reflect back on this because I know that there's a breakthrough around the corner. The breakthrough for us was to start working with those families directly. I went up there, I spent time with the families and I found out the attributes of the fiber which they can impact, and the attributes of this fiber which impact fabric quality, which sounds quite esoteric, but there's a number of attributes, tensile strength, uh, length, fiber diameter, purity, et cetera, that all impact quality. So what we did was we created a system. So with every icebreaker now, there's a, a code in here called barcode. You type it in, and you can actually go back to the original station, the original family that grew that wool, and you can go inside. We, we also publish uh, our whole manufacturing system. You can go inside, this one's called Middlehurst Station, which is uh, in the top of the South Island. You can look at it from different angles, and there's, and there's videos we can actually connect with the people. So for me, it was about this dream of connecting, you know, it was literally creating an eco, the, a, seeing a business as an ecosystem and using technology as a metaphor to explore that. But also it taught me this idea of prototyping because we did this fast. We built the company as this interconnected system of systems and all we did was lay the technology over the top to create that connection, this born worn connection, which was really a reflection of what I felt when I was 24, first working out 
what I wanted to do with my life and fell in love with the mountains and the whole cycle of nature up there. I wanted re to reconnect with that. So this idea of anything can be prototyped was taught to me through this barcode process where, you know, through, ra through quick iterations, we could get to deep storytelling. I also experienced it when I partnered with a company called IDEO, which is probably the best innovation company which is based in uh, the US. They've got offices in, in Palo Alto in New York. And they came and taught us uh, rapid prototyping techniques. They didn't just do it to us, they taught it. So the rest of my talk is going to be on sharing what I've learned around those techniques because I believe that they have great power to unlock imagination and intuition within a business or an organization or even a family. So this is about getting something out of your head and onto a page. It's democratizing design using design principles. So design traditionally is around a prototype for an improved uh, shell of a computer or an improved glass or something like that. There's a lot more we can actually prototype. Um, I'm using it for a lot of non-physical parts of our business, for example, systems. And before I get into, the de into how we've created, get, get in the process work, I just want to give you a little bit of an overview which I um, sketched out last night. So it starts somewhere. It starts either with a leap of what we want to create, some sort of future intention, or it comes, as a, it comes out as a response to a recurring problem. So for me, it was like um, we're having problem, we're having quality issues. What, what can what can we do? What can we do around that? Just trying to just trying to you know resolve the symptoms didn't work. We needed to get deeper into it. So the starting point of this process around rapid prototyping is either a recurring pr pr uh, problem, and I'll talk about this stuff a little bit later, or this future intention, which might bubble up somehow in the shower while we're having a cup of coffee, while we're going for a run. Um, or you can use this to actually distinguish intention in your life or in your business or your organization. The prototyping feedback loops then are a function of that. Think of this process as a brief. And we all know what we get is a function of what we imagine or see as possible. So there is a, uh, there's a relationship here. And there's a few principles that I'll get a little bit deeper into. The first one is speed reduces attachment. It's called rapid prototyping because it's about doing stuff quickly. It's, about, it's a fast and messy process to try and get stuff out of your head and onto a page and let that get evolved by how groups and people interact so it really harnesses the power of a collective group of people as opposed to one person. It is the opposite of craftsmanship. Prototype as if you're right, listen as if you're wrong, um, relates also to what uh, Laura was talking about around, around bias and, and around um, p p people. Um, what we, the, the rule here is that we talk to the prototype um, rather than just talking to the people. So the prototype actually becomes its own kind of entity that gets its own, that, that really gets molded. Think of it as a lump of clay. Okay, so really what this is about is what you imagine plus give form somehow comes true. So we call it the icebreaker way. I put an asterisk there, as, I just call it the icebreaker way because you know that's the vehicle that we use it in, but you can stick whatever word or organization you want in there. And it really is a combination of what Deepak has taught me over the years and what I was learning um, before, I, before I met you. Remember when we had that conversation, we did a show on Sirius around the seven spiritual laws and how they can be applied to business. And we kind of broke that down. There were four laws of uh, you know, poten potentiality, least effort, generosity, and karma, which are necessary prerequisites. A lot of the energy was the tension between setting an intention, losing attachment to it, as Rudy was talking about, and having it aligned with what feels purposeful, which is what the previous amazing speakers were talking about. So that kind of interaction between a view of the future 
which requires creativity and courage, not getting too attached to it. So we come from abundance rather than scarcity, needing it, in a way which is lined up with what we're committed to. And also some thinking which I've been involved in with Peter Senge from MIT around systems thinking, trying to engage holistic uh, approaches to problem solving. So this is what we do. We build two teams. There's a build team who are actually responsible for evolving the prototype. We find three to six people is great. It can be more. It shouldn't be less than that. And there's a feedback team. I put N equals question mark because depending how broadly you ask and publish your prototypes, it does two things. It depends on, it, 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 you've got to be careful but if you choose the right people, you will definitely uh, evolve your prototype, but also you'll educate others about what you're doing in the process. So this can be a very powerful technique within an organization. By gathering feedback around the ideas which I'm evolving with a group, which is based on an intention, intention which is agreed to within a business, we can actually give that idea life and form within an organization. It starts with this idea of a bitch list if we are starting with, with a problem-solving domain. We just call it that because it's the stuff that people are always bitching about. It's normally the recurring problems. Recurring problems don't go away. They normally just normally get a little bit deeper. So it's, they're a great place to start at looking for a breakthrough. So we start with a bitch list, and it's nothing more than a I wish type dump. Then we shape that into a, that kind of gets stuff out of people, off, you know, it get, just gets stuff out there. And you can actually really have a conversation about what is. From that, we use a little technique called from and to. It's very complex. It requires a whiteboard and a pen or a piece of paper. And all you do is you distinguish based on the recurring complaints, you know, kind of where we want to move from and what is possible on the other side. So the two is the realm of possibility. It's a fun process. This needs to be done fast. I'm talking like 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. You might have two groups doing it. They can swap, give feedback to the other one and try and pull it down. But from that two, that, well, sorry, the from is really you know, a way of encoding the complaints. But the two is a way of um, encoding the future intention of the project. Now this is a really, really, um, this is a um, really important part of the process because every project that is successful in any organization is always a function of the brief. So the intention is really, this is just a process to get a really great brief. Next we do something which Everyone hates doing, because if I said to you, uh, put your hand up if you're great at drawing. Okay, I'm not seeing a lot of hands. Um, and when you do that with a group of people, ask them to visually draw it, no one wants to do it. But this is the bit that breaks people free, because everyone does their own little drawing. It might be representational. There's many ways of doing it, but it reflects their perspective. And it's a way of not using language, but actually seeing relationships that often people can't express, or often people don't have the desire to express. So this for us is the key, getting visual models out of someone's head onto a page and then sharing those models. They might look like this over time, they might look like this, they're fast and they're messy, but that for me is the key for it. Now, I'll just jump through the rest of it, but basically all the insights are contained in those visual models. It's learning the perspectives, and the prototype is drawing the best of those and then gathering feedback against those. People give feedback to the prototype. The prototype itself is what evolves, and it really becomes a little bit of a vehicle of collective consciousness. Of course, you need project management to bring it into life, but I'm going to... We've applied it to a bunch of stuff, but I'm going to wrap up. We've applied it to all across the business. Actually, there's one point here. So what's cool is you're using both left brain and right brain functions. 
you're using both analytical side and the imagination side. And the speed reduces attachment for me is the access to the intuition where stuff comes up that people didn't even know they had within them. This right brain creativity, which either can be imagination or intuition. Now when that happens within a business that has a profound impact on people, and this is where I'll conclude, it gets people out of their box and talking to, the, talking to their prototype. It unlocks within a business creativity, self-expression, and creates empowerment in order to increase the contribution of the organization to society and of the individual to that organization. Everyone wants to be a part of something, and everyone wants to be proud of what they do. So an organization can be conscious and I remember one of the first conversations we had, we said, how can we shift business from being the antithesis of consciousness to becoming a vehicle of consciousness? Thanks. Thank you. So, Jeremy created a global brand from New Zealand and advises the New Zealand government now on how to make New Zealand uh, leader in global business and thinking in ecological terms. I think what really uh, enamored me with your whole process was that you were a storyteller and you know there's more and more evidence now that the most successful brands and tomorrow we're going to talk about this as well are brands that tell stories that are mythologies and people will buy your product or your service if they like your story. And this new story is about universality. It's about ecology. It's about uh, nurturing. And it's about tenderness. And it's about uh, caring. And just the idea that I can, you know, it's strange. I wear icebreaker all the time, just not today for some reason. But <laughs> there's a story right there. You know, you can. You can look at that and you can uh, go to a barcode and you know the family and the farm and the sheep and their relationships and the whole life cycle. And when you're done with the shirt, you can, you can bury, bury it. it. You can bury yeah. it and you can fertilize the rose garden. So thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank you very Great. much. Love you. Uh -huh.